it's really important to be having this conversation in light of COVID-19 situation. Um, and then we are going to hand over to you guys to ask any questions you like to me or Catherine um, about the issues that you guys are facing at this time because it's unprecedented times. Um, I know a lot of you have gone through um, living in isolation before and I think it's really important to be equipped with um, different ways of managing that and having difficult conversations with um, friends, family, loved ones um, about how to, um, you know, get through in with relationships intact. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce you to the lovely Catherine Hood, who I had the pleasure of uh, sending an email to two years ago, um, asking her to be a part of our Trek Stop Talk. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much. Pleasure. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and why are we doing this about community? Why are we doing yeah. <laughs> my, So my name's Catherine. Uh, I am a doctor, so I'm a physician, uh, but I work in the sexual problems clinic at St Pancras Hospital. So that's one of my jobs. So I'm psychologically trained as well as um, physically trained. Uh, uh, and so I see a lot of people who are in relationships that are maybe suffering or having difficulties. So I uh, do a lot of that. But also, uh, in, in addition, I have a broader remit and I developed... Um, and over the last 20 years really have spent a lot of time looking at communication within healthcare and that's both uh, with uh, healthcare professionals and how we talk to individuals and also uh, how we share information and um, in, in broader ways other than just in the consultation so yeah fantastic a lot about communication <laughs> and, and I mean communications what how would you define communication well, it's how we, I think it's how we interact with the world and how we also sense the world, how we let the world interact with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are social beings as humans, so we are, we are born to connect. And I think this is one of the difficulties of the current situation yeah. in we're being told we can't, which is very alien to most of us. Um, or we're being told that we are having to limit the ways and, and work new ways. Um, to communicate and all I can say is that you know at least at the moment we at least we have the internet uh, yeah. and if this had happened sort of 20 years ago I think this whole experience would be very different <laughs> it would be very different yeah. um, obviously we are relying massively on social media um, and zoom has become the word of the of the moment I mean I'm sure there are other platforms but zoom has definitely seemed to have rocketed in uh, its uh, need um, how do you think that's playing out in the way that we communicate with one another? Um, what do you think we're gaining possibly by using this platform? And then I might ask you what you think we're losing. losing. As well. yeah, yeah, there are there are definitely pros and cons. Uh, I think there. I think these sort of platforms and video conferencing is a is a fantastic tool, and I am really really pleased that we have it at this time because, as I say, I think it is really helping people, particularly people who are isolating on their own to connect with somebody else outside and, and by that to see their face to see facial expressions to be able to read emotions because we don't just communicate by how we talk we also look at uh, a lot of body language and non-verbal communication mm. and that's actually really important to us in terms of a sense of feeling that we have connected with somebody um, and so it, it and there's been some studies that have done that have shown that, that if we video conference, so if I can see somebody's face, it is almost as good as seeing them in person. Um, and the, the, in terms of that sense of connectivity, it goes down. If we, if we just speak to somebody on the phone, it's not as good as seeing them. Uh, if we then text or we email, that's not, again, that's another step down. That doesn't make us feel quite so connected. So this kind of video conferencing platform, I think, is brilliant. And what do you think we lose? Well, the, I was saying earlier that, you know, that we only see what we see in this, this mirror so that we're still sort of screening out quite a lot of the nonverbal communication. So there's a lot that I can't see. I, you know, I'm looking at you and you look terribly relaxed, but your legs might be jiggling up and down. You might look completely <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> I, yesterday I did a, a, a very so academic webinar and I was wearing a very smart, you know, jacket and uh, and everything, and underneath I had a pair of jogging bottoms and my slippers, you know, it's... <laughs> Very <laughs> nice too. I'm wearing a skirt, just to let everyone know. I'm actually, I'm dressed for the occasion. <laughs> so we are missing out a lot of cues. Um, and also uh, sometimes the context, you know, I, we have to get used to this being, you know, a, a, 
this being a way of, it can be very formal or it can be very informal. Um, and not to be upset if it becomes informal, because sometimes I think one of the downsides is that, uh, you know, you feel a slave to the camera. So we feel, mm. oh gosh, I can't go on, go on. You know, even if I'm FaceTiming my family, I can't go on unless I've brushed my hair or I've put on some clothes or <laughs> FaceTime in the bath, you know. And so, we, you know, at the same time, we say, I've now, I FaceTime my mum who's isolating on her own. I do it every day. And now she's used to me FaceTiming while I'm doing the cooking at the same time. Yeah. And it's fine. She doesn't get upset about the fact that I'm doing the cooking. It's, it, it's just a quite nice. It's almost actually becomes nice because she's being brought into my day. I, I love that. I think it's lovely. And you feel you don't feel quite so alone. Yeah. On, the, on that note, actually, obviously, the young adults that we support with Trekstock are um, obviously have gone through cancer, which which levels them. But at the same time, lots of them will be experiencing very different things at this time. So obviously they've gone through one trauma. Now they're living COVID-19 and many of them are having to um, shield. But one of the things I realized is that some of them may have loads of children and having to juggle still work and all of that. Other people may be dealing with flatmates. Other people may be dealing with just having their partner at home and other people may be on their own. So, um, it's a very different experience for each one of us and I have to say to myself daily like to have grace for the space that people find themselves in and uh, I do it very badly at times um, and feel rejected and abandoned by by friends when they're not quite so there because they're caught up in their own how do you navigate that how do you hold each other's boundaries I suppose exactly. I, think, I think that word grace for each other I think is very important I think it's really important we keep a sense of compassion for everybody because I think one thing that demarcates this is that we are all in this together and everybody at the moment is trying to find a way through it mm -hmm. uh, be it whether they're isolating on their own or with a with a family and even the best family in the world it's going to have their tensions and difficulties yeah. as a result of this, because also, you know, in terms of our sense of control, we all like to feel we have a sense of control on the world, but we don't know how this is going to end. We do not know how long this is going to go on for. Mm -hmm. So we can't control that end point. And for a lot of people who've gone through a cancer treatment, that might actually itself be quite triggering because that's one of the, again, might be a predominant feeling that was quite upsetting going through treatment is that sense of we don't know how this is going to end. We don't know what the future will bring um, and when will this finish. Um, and, uh, and it may echo. So, you, so people who, who have been through trauma might actually fi be finding this quite difficult again because it's bringing back feelings of that, that trauma that they had. But also they may be getting quite angry with other people who are not managing it quite as well as they had to. Um, because, you know, now we're all in it together. But at the time you went through, you went through it on your own. And, yeah. and you know, people who may be sort of whinging now, you may get quite annoyed with actually, because, you know, you had to do it and it was harder. And they it, were there or weren't there or whatever. Weren't but, there or weren't like, there. Very, yeah. yeah. Um, um, it's difficult. I think it's really um, important. You taught me a huge amount when um, we did the Trekstock talk two years ago um, about the fact that stating one's needs, it's so hard. It's like absolutely, it's like almost scratching your nails down a, down a blackboard. <laughs> it feels that painful. It feels that, that like grating in your heart. How do you do like, so let's say if we, we do some scenarios, yeah. you've got a flat, you're living with flatmates yeah. and they just are not socially distancing in the way that you, you really need if you need to protect yourself um, at this time or your, or your family on, on, you know, um, doing what you really need them to do to be able to protect your health. How do you have that conversation with them about actually, I really need you to do this. Those words are, well, I, the first thing is, is if it's starting to annoy you, don't ignore it. <laughs> okay? Because if these things are allowed to fester, they just get worse. And the worst thing is if you could, you're sitting there and feeling scared and feeling worried and feeling that you're being personally, that your safety is being put at risk. You have yeah. to say something. You can't just let it lie. And you can't rely on people to pick it up because if they've never been through the situation, they may not really understand where you're coming from. And I think the first thing to do is to is if you're in a house and they're their friends or if they're family is to say, can we have a chat about how we're going to manage this situation? 
Okay, it's hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. with that. And say so, that for me, I've obviously had this problem, or I have to be particularly careful. So for me, can we just make sure that we maintain that distance? And I am going to say something if if we don't. What do you think about that? And I think it's perfectly reasonable. And most people would say, oh yeah, of course, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, and I actually most people want to be reasonable. It's just that they're they're not thinking. Yeah, most of the time. And, and the, you have to state what's important for you. You really do and find the words to do it. And you can do it in a non-confrontational way. Um, so uh, obviously lots of us um, deal with being triggered by, yeah. by other people's lack of response or poor response. Um, so I was wondering if we could kind of explore that. So that sense mm -hmm. of, I've spoken to lots of the community, the Trackstock community, who felt really, we're going to be doing a talk about friendship, so we won't go completely there. But <laughs> at this time, um, you know, my friends aren't calling me quite as much as I need. Um, I really think they should just get it. They should just pick up the phone and understand how I'm feeling. Yeah. We all want that. We want that magic friend who just, and there are a few. There are unicorn friends out there. Um, yeah. But not all, not, not many, actually. Yeah. yeah. How do we, first of all, picking up that phone is hard enough sometimes when all you want is someone to reach out to you. Yes. How do you, first of all, you know, got to make that step, but how do you say those words without, first of all, someone feeling obligated or, um, and that can shut someone down quite quickly. How do you hold that in a, in a compassionate way? I think, the, I think the first thing is, it is to keep this compassion in mind. Everybody is going through this and people are managing it differently. Some people, bizarrely, are reaching out to people they haven't talked to for years mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly getting in touch because there's a sense of feeling like, oh no, you know, we need to, I need to connect with those people that meant something to me that I haven't contacted for a while. Um, whereas other people are hunkering down and finding it very difficult to talk to people. And it's very easy to take it very personally because you think it's a, you know, oh gosh, it's because they don't want to talk to me. Actually, it's probably they're, they're struggling. That's they're right. really struggling. And, uh, and the thing to do, I, I think, is always to just kindly actually stretch out. I mean, I had some friends who, who recently set up a Zoom conference between all of us. Uh, and actually, that was lovely because I could tell that they were, they were struggling uh, and maybe I hadn't rung them. But they said, right, I'm going to do, be proactive. So I'm going to do a Zoom conference. I'm going to invite the people that I'd like to speak to. And it was actually really lovely to see everybody's face mm. uh, and to realise, oh, yeah, they're not angry with me. They're not annoyed. They're not, you know, it's actually that they've got their own stuff going on at the moment. And bizarrely, I, it's, isolation is very, very busy time for quite a lot of people. It's not, it's not, they don't actually necessarily have a lot of time and a lot of emotional space. Yeah. Um, but finding those times where you can connect or just sending a text and saying, uh, I would love to catch up. I uh, hope you're okay. I hope you're managing this well and reach out to them. It's often the first time, first kind of opening for them to then get back in touch with you because they may not know how to reach to you. Mm, definitely. I think, I think it's that. And then I, something I was thinking about is we're, we're such social beings. Some of us, one of my <laughs> friends says it's the most joyous time for her because she's an introvert. So, you know, how do we manage all of that as well? You know, um, yeah, some people are introverts and all of us have, I, I think to be honest, all of us have both bits. bits. I think the two more I've spent time on my own. Yeah. Yeah. And even the introverts need to connect. It's actually really important to stay connected because it's very easy to slip into actually being quite depressed and isolated. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you just keep, pulling away from people so even the introverts I think it's very important to make those say right I know I haven't spoken to anyone for a while I need to talk to somebody because I think if we just spend a lot of time in our own heads um, we tend to ruminate about things we tend to things go over and over and over and sometimes we need to just talk we need to be able to get it out so that we can almost moderate our yeah. feelings and our thinking because otherwise we tend to go towards extremes either extreme happiness or extreme sadness or and so when we connect with somebody else what we do is we we sort of modulate our feelings uh and we we start to actually reevaluate where we are and it's very healthy 
for us. So even if, if even the introverts need to be careful not to get too introverted. But also, if you are somebody social, I think the other thing to recognise is that people don't want to be connecting all the time. And if you're isolating with other people, you have to be respectful that there are some times, even in a small household, where those individuals actually just don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> they just need some space so if you are if you are isolating with other people in a small space just be respectful that they sometimes need to not be talking to anyone uh, and sometimes you need to not be talking to anyone so you sort of have to almost set the boundaries of when you want to connect and when you don't want to connect is it literally as logical as that state it have a con say, conversation. Yeah, or just start to have a routine, have a plan. Uh, have a time where you go, let's have lunch together, or we cook together, or... But then there's no expectation in the rest of the time that you connect necessarily, unless somebody reaches out. Now, the, the word expectation is something that has a lot of loadedness <laughs> to it. Do you think a lot of us expect things without stating need? Absolutely. So do we live in a dream world that we expect people to understand we expect people to be compassionate we expect people to come and come knocking and check we're okay yes i think we do i think we go in with a lot of expectations and i think one of the interesting things about the whole isolation thing is the whole expectation I mean, when when the whole isolation started i saw a lot of kind of things in the media about saying you know william shakespeare wrote some of his best plays yeah. when he was in isolation and you're thinking great now we're racking up the uh, expectation of what we are supposed to achieve during isolation yeah the reality is most of us during isolation are going to go through a range of emotions there's going to be times when we're feeling a bit sad and a bit introverted and times when we're desperate to actually talk to somebody times when we are anxious times when we are okay and that's normal <laughs> so that we are going to have a range of emotions and we're also not necessarily going to be as productive as we might like to think in yeah. a dream ideal world that we will be <laughs> i mean so, that's really important to have compassion in yourself isn't it oh, completely because if if you're isolating if you've got children at the moment you may be finding that you're having to have them at home so you're having to be a, a mum or a dad or a teacher or <laughs> and also then having to work if you're having to work as well and having to be in isolation and not connecting with other people or having that usual outlets that you have so it can be quite difficult and the thing is you just be nice to yourself you know what you can achieve is what you can achieve but just try and do a bit every day and um, in terms of this um i know a lot of the young adults in the track community are coping with going home so have gone home uh, and I don't know about you, but you know, regression happens as soon as you hang out with your siblings or you're in a dynamic of parent child again, even though you're two adults, as I always tell my mother. Um, how do you deal with regression? How do you deal with the aggression that comes with regression? <laughs> I mean, I have a feeling that we all descend to about the age of 11. I think, I th I, I think we have that. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, you know, and it's, and partly our parents, you know, we have to fit in with their routine. Mm -hmm. um, and parents, and, uh, you know, I am one, so I'm as guilty as any, you know, we, we like to stay in control of our family and, and as well. And sometimes I think it's, it's important to say if you are going home and you're, you're in your parental house again, is to have a conversation with your parents about how, how your life runs and how their life runs and how you're going to connect. Because they don't, again, they don't necessarily know that, you know, so if you want to do your own washing, say, mum, it's fine, I can do my own washing, or I'm quite happy to make my own food, or, you know, have times again that you connect and times you don't, but talk, 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 and have a plan. And try to enjoy the time, actually, because very, you know, when this is over, we're all going to be going, oh, during that time, I had all that time I could have, you know, spoken to my mum or, you know, gone and helped my dad with the gardening or whatever, and I, you know, didn't. And so, you know, try to do things together and try and make the most of the time that you have here and think of the positives uh, as well as the difficulties. But it is going to be a bit frustrating going back to parents and going back to the family home. So you need to, again, keep your own space if you can. Uh, have your own time just be really honest with your parents look I need a bit of time I'm just going to go up to my room for a bit I'll come down but but when you are down try and connect with them help with dinner help with things so you become part of the household 
yeah um rather than allowing yourself to regress to the age of 11 <laughs> and let everybody else do everything and secretly resent it underneath <laughs> that's not going to help either <laughs> now um a lot of the community have said to me my friends have really hurt me. How do you start that conversation? How, because I feel really um, empowered when I have those conversations with my friend. I find them very hard. But how do you say, you know, stating what happened? Because a lot of, you don't really want to lose friendships through this COVID-19. No. You don't want to make up a whole narrative around it all, which I, living on my own, very guilty of. Um, how do you, because it's it's hard, right? Saying, you know, how how would you if you were doing a role play, how would you how would you play that out? So if it was a friend and I was connecting, and even if I was having a conversation like this, uh, I think the first thing is to find the time to have the conversation. Uh, usually, conversations late at night, if they're going to be difficult, it's, that's not the best time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Having a conversation um, earlier in the day is better, um, particularly so that the conversation doesn't need to go on for too long but also people can then think about it and maybe connect back later in the day if you're connecting out of the house it's the same in, in you know if you're isolating together yeah is to talk about it earlier in the day so that you can actually resolve it before the evening uh, if you can um the first thing is to just um stay calm uh know what it, what it is that you want to say know what it is that really has bothered you because sometimes we get very upset when somebody does something and actually it's more about us than it is about them and what they've done and so you need to sort of understand what exactly has happened uh, so for example uh, if you just got angry with somebody and they, they just really annoyed you um, what is it that really annoyed you what is it that actually hurt you is it the fact that they didn't reply to your text is it the fact that they they just took too long or was it the tone in which they replied or what is it what is it that was difficult mm -hmm. but more importantly what is it you would like them to do differently next time so that this doesn't happen again yeah because it is about you know you can say to somebody and the reason why you have to arm yourself ideally with this is because you want to have a positive constructive yeah. talk with somebody and so when you do then sit down, you say, hi, lovely to see you, lots of positives and say, look, I, there's something I really need to say. And I know it's difficult. I found it very difficult. And the thing is using I phrases. Mm -hmm. I found it very difficult um, when this situation that we had last week or whatever it is, I found it actually very difficult when I have read your text because I, I found it very, I, this is the way I interpreted it. What would have been better for me is if uh, it, it had said things in a different way. So you avoid the accusatory um, language, which is you did this, you did that, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. It's, it's owning the feeling. So owning how you felt about it and then putting something forward. You know, I was thinking about it and it really upset me because they'll probably say, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. So, well, I tell you what would be great next time would be if da 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 or the way that this is done or whatever you'd like this thing to change. What do you think about that? Would you, you know, would that be okay? Would that work? Yeah, would that work? Um, one of my great friends is always says that in a friendship, you should always say your expectations and your needs. Um, what if the response is no? Well, then you have to say, okay, you have to respect their decision. If that's no, say, okay. And then ideally, sometimes you have to walk away from things. There are some... You know, you have to make a decision. Is my life better with this person or is it better without them? There are some people who are not necessarily good for you at particular times in your life. Yeah. Uh, and we need to surround ourselves with people who are, who are positive. And that doesn't mean that we constantly be surrounded by people who tell us that we're great because that would be lovely, but maybe unrealistic. But it's people who, who actually come from a, a, a place of caring for us. And if there are people who are, are, are no longer giving us that kind of positive, nurturing... I mean, friends, this is, this is how all relationships have to work. They have to adapt. They have to... And it'd be both ways, you know. They may say to you, well, actually, when you do this, it's really difficult for me. And you have to be able to accept it and go, OK, all right, well, I'll, you know, OK, let's see. Let's see what's going to work. Let's look forward. But if somebody's saying no and is just being intransigent, then you have to kind of go, well, OK, maybe you're not the right person right now to be yeah. 
the person that I'm talking to. And that's hard because you have to accept that you have to let something go. Mm. And ending a friendship is hard. Ending a friendship is very difficult. It's like ending anything. It's a, it's a loss. So you have to go through a sort of grieving process with, mm. associated with that, uh, during which it just feels rubbish. But you know you will get out the other end of it. It will finish. You will feel better. And um, one of my favourite people, Brené Brown, talks about marble jar friends, mm -hmm. um, which is the idea through the years they've filled up your, each thing that they do, they, um, they get a marble in, in their jar. Yeah. And each time someone states a need, someone has a, a choice of how they respond. And she talks about, you know, when the response is really not loving and not compassionate, um, a marble comes out of the jar. Yeah. And there's certain things that cause the whole jar to fall over and that's that. Um, a lot of the community have said to me, you know, it's a long time since I spoke to that friend. Um, I don't, we don't, you know, it's kind of gone. But one, uh, one of the things I said, you don't know what's going on in the life of that person. We talked a lot about hierarchy of needs and the fact there isn't one, but we all view top trumps of trauma um you know uh and see that mine what's what what's happening to me at this time if someone's going through cancer then what has happened to me doesn't matter or or you know they may be going through infertility or whatever mm -hmm. how do how how would you say because friendship is about mutuality right um, yeah. and about um 70% sometimes you know you need them 70% and they don't and they, you're leaning more on them than they're leaning on you at times. So it's a bit of a f ebb and flow. Absolutely, and that's how friendship should be. And what do you think we, um, this hierarchy of need, I remember you saying that when someone, um, you need to be able to pick someone up, but you can't pull them down to your level. You can't, and you need, to, it's, it, it's, it's about being the friend that is there to support, but you can't, you can't over lean on somebody because nobody can take the weight. Uh, so it's about having a network of people around you that you can use. And then so sometimes when somebody is, you know, it is about having compassion and understanding. Some people are not in a space necessarily to be the person to help you at times. Yeah. Uh, and so you then have to be able to draw on other resources or other people if you're in, if you're in need um, and not blame that other person that, much if you can uh, but you're right that you know i have a, another way of looking at you you know this that the, you know friendships can become drains or radiators uh, there are those that radiate to you there are those that drain you uh, and there are times where if something becomes over draining you just sometimes have to go i you just you know walk away from it mm -hmm. um, but it is very difficult because we always think of our needs as being far greater and more important than other people's and they may be but for that individual, if they're struggling with their needs, it's very difficult for them to have enough to, to help us at times. Yeah. Uh, and that's not necessarily a failing, it's just that's where their life is at this particular moment. Yeah. But the most important thing is to talk about it and to find out where they're coming from. And to um, and if somebody has upset you, say, look, I'm really sorry, but you know, what's happening with your life? Is that, what is it that's, what is it? Find out, be curious, find out what it is that's, that's stopping them from getting back to you. Yeah. You, uh, I sent you a text and I didn't hear anything. I, I hope you're okay. Uh, if you're not, here's, you know, do get in touch any time. Mm. You know, because people are struggling and sometimes we, they won't, some people are not very good at saying when they are. Yeah, very, very true. And we do, have no idea what goes on behind closed doors, do we? We really don't. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, people don't necessarily talk about the things that worry them. And there are a lot of people who, at the moment you mentioned infertility, there's a lot of people who are worried about that and who can't get treatment. There's a lot of people at the moment who are waiting for treatment for various things and they can't access it. Uh, it's a very uncertain time. And so there are people who are going to be financially worried at the moment. And that's going to be an absorbing um, uh, concern but not not necessarily one that they will easily and readily talk about and also it doesn't trump anything that you're going through it's that sense of like I won't talk to that person because they've got too much going on it's that sense of like we're all going through something and yeah. so uh, whether there's some form of you know uh, this chapter being a different one so lots of people are saying their friends aren't getting in touch at this time so it's about being the person saying 
doing that text and saying, you know, are you really struggling? You know, I, I, I'm struggling too. I'm struggling too, exactly. Rather well, than saying, I'm going through cancer and I'm going through isolation. Why the hell are you not doing it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and even though I can understand that, that sentiment, I can understand that anger and that annoyance, um, but that's not necessarily going to help somebody to, to, to reach out. To reach out. Yeah, very much so. Um, and there was one other thing that I think is really important is that sense of listening to yourself. We talked a lot about that. I know that um, I can be guilty of filling my time, even though I'm in isolation on my own, so I don't have to listen to the chatter in my head. Um, how do you um, take time to be compassionate to yourself and listen to yourself and hear? It's, it's, then you might not need as much um, soothing from other people if you learn to self-soothe as well. At the moment, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because we all have, you know, different ways of treating ourselves. For some people, it's going shopping. Other people, it's going having their hair done. Other people, it's going out for a drink. Other, and, you know, and all these avenues of sort of <laughs> self-care are just getting mm -hmm. shut off. Yeah. So we are just here. Um, and that, I think, has been quite, quite challenging. The most important thing in isolation is, first of all, to just keep a structure to your day. Yeah. Keep some form of structure going um because it's very you need to have some time to think and to reflect absolutely and check in with yourself but not so much that you stop doing other things mm -hmm. because what is also very important is having a sense of purpose in isolation so we have to mix it up a little bit and so the thing is i would always have a bit of structure for the day you talked about exercise i think exercise is an amazing bit of self-care yeah. that we can do makes us feel much better because the tent temptation i don't know if you know, i saw this that it was a meme going around of you know spend it expenditure whilst in isolation you know self-care zero you know going out zero transport zero food two thousand five hundred sixty five pounds you know it's <laughs> what? we the tendency is we're just going to eat our way or drink our way into out of you know isolation and so we need to kind of keep a little bit of sense of control. We can't control the world at the moment, so we can control what's happening within our, our sense of isolation. So I think it's keeping us a structure um, and in part of that structure is doing a bit of work sometimes, limiting how much we start, we start ruminating about things. Look at what triggers anxiety. You know, quite often people worry about if they watch the news too much and the news, let's face it, isn't changing a lot at the moment. Yeah. It's, it's more of the same and rolling news I think is it can be a real problem with um, in terms of anxiety so just limit how much you know if it's just if it's once a day keep informed but you don't need to be looking every moment and it's the same as social media social media is great but looking at it too much is is difficult in terms of the sense of purpose start doing things that you haven't done I mean I'm not talking about William Shakespeare and writing a play but you know there are lots of online forums of people that you know like the same things that you might just take some time to go and connect with some of those and do things that make you feel good or make you feel like you're learning still or you're still understanding then it is about checking in some time with yourself be in the moment you look at some mindfulness apps do some yoga if you can get out if you're lucky enough to have a garden go and sit in the garden the weather's fantastic you know go for a walk have some self-reflection time mm -hmm. Um, but limit it. So have that time. That's my self-reflection time. Now I need to go and get on with something else. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's, and it's having a good bedtime routine as well, you know, so, you know, stop looking at things at a certain point. Don't keep looking at Facebook just before you go to bed or Instagram or whatever it is, or the things that worry you uh, and have a kind of more of a pampering. Okay. How have I been? Okay. I'm all right. Yeah. Who are the people I want to talk to tomorrow? Just plan one day at a time and have a, have a purpose for each day if you can. So, you know, if you haven't, you're thinking, oh, no, I haven't spoken. Okay, I'm going to ring them tomorrow. So tomorrow, my list of things that I'm going to try and do during my connection space that I've given myself, I will do that. Uh, and just try and keep going one day at a time. Yeah. And with that, we'll get out of it. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. That's been incredibly useful. I'm going to open the floor to everybody else. Um, there is a space for you to put questions in the Q&A or you can just send me a chat, guys. Um, is there any questions you want to ask Catherine? 
any scenarios that you have or comments? Oh yeah, we've got one. Ooh, interesting. Um, what's the best way to support a friend who's still at work and having to cope with um, working and being isolated? Thank you. Is that somebody who is still at work as in, um, you know, it's very difficult. I've got a lot of friends who are frontline workers at the moment. Um, yeah. And you know, for them, it's very difficult because they're seeing a lot of things and having to deal with a lot of trauma in the moment. Um, I think the first thing is just to, to stay connected with them, find a time that you can talk, that they can talk, and don't necessarily talk about COVID if that's what they're working in, um, but have time to talk about other things. Uh, you know, again, it's you, if you've got joint... Uh, you know, we did a quiz night with various people who are key workers, and we, it was just nothing to do with the current situation. Uh, talk about something else if that, that helps, but also be there if they want to talk about any trauma that they're going through. Um, in terms, he says he's not on the front line, his friend isn't on the front line, but he, his job is becoming more and more stressful. People are being furloughed um, and financial difficulty. Is it about learning to listen rather than to, to give advice? Yeah, at this stage, I think it is about learning to listen because probably he hasn't got any that this is what's so difficult. We're having to deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, people are being furloughed. They don't know, yes, they've still got a job, but they're not necessarily going to have an income and what's going to happen at the end of this. So I think at the moment we don't have any answers. So often it's a providing a space where people can talk about the worries, but not necessarily have go, okay, well, look, we're here for you. And this, you know, one step at a time and but also help them get through day to day. So just be there for emotional support, but also you can't answer, you can't solve this problem. None of us can. He says, I find myself repeating myself when texting him all the time. Do you think it's about saying that? I would, you know, it depends what he's, he's repeating. I and mean, if it's, it, it, texting is not great. Is there a way to connect to either face to face? I think is the... So meaning have a Zoom call. A Zoom call. Think about that, Ryan? Or FaceTime, if that's easier, or Instagram. Sounds good. Uh, and um, in terms of just listening to him and his fears, um, and maybe, is it about saying, I, I don't know? Um, you so, know? What, this is a really, and empathising. This is a yeah. massively difficult situation. When you, you know, do you have any sense of when you're going to know the answers to some of these things? Gosh, I know that must be difficult for you. Is there anything I can do to help? Just knowing, yeah, fantastic. That's it. It's really simple, but there's no answers. In, and it's being comfortable with the fact that actually there are no answers at the moment, which is hard because we all like to solve things. One of my friends said to me, and I'll never forget it, she was like, I can't do anything about it, so I'm not going to ask you about it. And I was like, uh, well, you're off the list of me when you're on COVID, aren't you, mate? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was an interesting time. Um, lovely Grace has been diagnosed with stage four cancer. I'm so sorry, Grace. Um, she's really struggling with her diagnosis and obviously it's being exasperated by COVID. Not seeing friends, etc. Any advice of how she can cope and um, find connection? Is that what you're meaning, Grace? Is, um, obviously it's very lonely in this experience. Uh, in terms of reaching out to others who are stage four? Yeah, or, or through patient groups or through, there are lots of online communities, I mean, like this or the others that can help you feel more connected with people. Um, yeah. And if you, you know, you're, from a healthcare point of view, your, your doctors are still there for you and your nurses, even though they are, may, may not be immediately able to, you, you can reach out to them if you're struggling. Grace, have you, um, are you finding that your friends don't know what to say to you? I mean, that's a really hard one, isn't it? We want yeah. to be one to support friends. Me and Catherine have talked about that. And being able to, to, you know, it's really, really hard when your friend gets diagnosed and you don't, you can't make it better. Yeah. And so, they've, you know, your friends may be feeling a bit helpless. And I know it's, 
it's really weird to be the first one to make a positive step towards a friend to say, I, gee, I'm still the same person that I was before this diagnosis. Um, you know, that, can we chat? Uh, but it's it, it, sometimes you have to be. It's because people don't know what to say. They don't know how to manage it. Oh, bless her. She hasn't been able to tell them how bad the diagnosis is. Um, so yeah. you're holding that on your own, Grace. And I would find a, a, if there is a friend who is maybe more understanding or, you know, it's good to confide that with somebody because keeping it inside may just be, you know, you are having to manage that on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may find if there is a friend who's particularly, there are, will be people out there who are more compassionate or more understanding is to just, you know, have a face-to-face -face conversation with them, even if it's by you know, a video, video link. It's not the best. I mean, it's not as nice as it is as having, getting a hug from somebody and being able to be, um, but the, but the pluses of it are, you can actually, the other thing about video conferencing is you can control it as well. So you can decide when you have that conversation. <laughs> um, I agree, Ryan, the cancer community will always listen and support. Um, I'm glad to hear you've got a supportive husbands and siblings. It, I just wondered, Grace, is it the fact that it's just too hard to say out loud or you don't want to burden them? Are you still there, Grace? Are they not? Okay. No. So they do know, but you just find it hard to discuss it. Okay. Um, Grace, I'm going to put you in touch with the wonderful secondary sisters, um, Laura and Nikki. Um, if you drop me an email at health.trex.com, I can link you with them. Um, and our heart goes out to you and your family at this time. Absolutely. It must be really, really hard at this time because um, all we want is a hug, right? Um, you more than ever, I bet. Um, is there any other questions or comments on whether this has been helpful and any other aspects that you want us to discuss? Does anyone struggle with um, being back home? Or always living with their parents and getting older? Ah. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's such a wonderful comment. I will say that in a minute. Um, oh, that is a really hard one. So uh, a group of girls are in a group about um, lymphoma and they're all struggling in the sense of being alone with their thoughts a lot. And um, all they and a lot of them are thinking about the, the, the cancers coming back because they're, they're ruminating on, on that. Yeah. And how do you know you're supporting one another, but at the same time coping with them really uh, scaring each other, I expect, most probably. Yeah, how, how and, do you na navigate that. Okay, I think the first thing is to, to, to share that feeling. Is anybody finding that they're talking about this too much or are we talking about this too much? If you've got a group and you're connecting virtually, um, you know, so are we, you know, can we, it's okay to say sometimes, can we talk about something else? <laughs> can we talk about something else that's happening in life that is, and but still have times when you do talk about it because it's important not to shut it down, but it's to sort of limit it. Or if you're struggling and finding that you're thinking about it too much, go, okay, let's, let's think about something else for a bit. Do you think okay. it's okay to drop out the group for a bit as well? Yeah, absolutely. And just say, look, I, and, and be honest, say, look, I just feel I need a break. Mm -hmm. uh, or to connect with other friends that you have that the way you, it's not all about the worry about the cancer. Because, you know, that's, it's a, it's a common, this is the problem of, of, of knowing when you're spending too much time with your own thoughts. Um, uh, and, you know, getting that rationality back of going, actually, okay, actually, I haven't got any symptoms that I had before. I've had, I know I've seen the doctors. If you are worried, go, you know, talk to your doctors or talk to your cancer experts. But, you know, it's fine to sometimes say, I'm just going to take a break. I need to think about something else for a bit and, and, and talk about other things about life and future. And, 
get yourself out of that headspace a little bit, but still be there for somebody. You don't need to shut it off completely. So it's about managing it for the well-being of yourself as well. Absolutely. You really do need to check in with yourself and stay and stay in the present, stay mindful, stay, you know, if you're doing things like yoga and mindfulness and just to, to get those thoughts, because they are just thoughts that go in on our heads. And sometimes when we pay too much attention to them, they become huge. So we have to learn. To... How do we, yeah, how do we stop that happening? That's a hard one, isn't it? Because, <laughs> because thoughts can, you know, the idea of the wonderful mindfulness, the other day, thoughts are things that come and go, and then other ones kind of um, blow up like a huge hot air balloon right in front of you and overwhelm you. They do everyone sometimes, yeah. and I think it's um, and that's partly partly sometimes a bit of a trauma response because you you're reliving the trauma of rethinking this for the first yeah. time, or when you were told about it, uh, and it's about um, kind of trying to reframe that and go through all the reasons why you know you haven't got it. If you've if you've been given reassurance by uh, having had tests or scans or whatever, just to, you know, give yourself down and give yourself a bit of a talking to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine do some breathing exercises, let the anxiety go. So just do some deep breathing and just, you know, think on some positive things, put yourself a, a list of positive messages about the fact that you are okay. Go for a walk, go and do something that takes your head out of that space. And we've got a lovely comment here that says it's been extremely helpful. Thank you so much. I'm living with my partner and her family. And now I know how best to communicate. <laughs> Good. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, any other questions? Oh, my pleasure. Um, where's Grace? I'll move down. Um, is there anything else that anyone wants to... Um, ask Catherine before she before we leave and um, we really, really hope we've equipped you with the tools to be able to have those difficult conversations but with love and compassion to everyone including yourself would you say um, Catherine what would be your closing comment on this I, time and communication I would say that this is a very extraordinary time that we are all living through at the moment um, and I think you have to draw on your resilience. I think all of your Trek Stock community have been through uh, difficult times, and this is just another one. Uh, and many of you will have been through more difficult times than this. So, but do keep communicating, keep talking, talking, talking. Um, keep looking after yourselves. Make sure you get up in the morning. You have a structure for your day. Uh, but if you are worried about things, nip things in the bud. If you are, have communication issues with the people you're isolating with or with any of your friends, just say them, don't let them fester. <laughs> um, be kind to yourself and be uh, mindful that other people as well are going through a new experience. So we're, we're all in it together. Um, but I, but my, you know, I wish you all the best. And, uh, and one day this will go, this will end at some point. We don't know when, but it will. <laughs> we will come out of this. There's one more comment here. Um, yeah, from Ellen saying structure is so important to our day. It is. And um, being really mindful of how you're feeling and and um, listening to yourself and, and, you know, all of those feelings about your friends and all of that is, is all valid. But it's about how big that they become in your head when the reality can be that you can nip it in the bud, as Catherine said, which is definitely music to my ears. I think I've got to do, pick up the phone to a friend. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Catherine, as oh, ever, pleasure. most wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you to you all for listening. And our next talk is on the 28th of April and is on the beauty of sleep. <laughs>